I want to talk to you today about mixed media and how mixed media can be a fantastic way to fill a sketchbook with beauty and powerful images that are fun to do. And we're going to talk to my friend Seth Apter. I've known Seth for many years, and he, in fact, started out as a student of mine long ago, but he's now become one of the best mixed media artists and teachers in this country. And we're lucky to have him as part of our Spark membership program. And he's going to explain how making mixed media is about process, about constantly improvising and reinventing what you're doing as you're doing it. It's an incredibly liberating process where you get into a creative flow and get deeper and deeper and have an incredible creative adventure. I really love his process. It's inspired me and a lot of the work that I do as well. And it's inspired many of the students at Sketchbook School. So I can't wait for you to meet Seth and see some of his work. Here's my friend, Seth Apter. Hey, how's it going, Seth? Hey, Danny, I am doing well. Thank you so much. Good, good. Well, I'm glad to have a chance to chat with you and uh, to talk about a really interesting uh, type of sketchbook, which is a mixed media sketchbook or a mix, mixed media journal. And um, let's start with the basics. What is mixed media? What does that mean exactly? You know, I think that's the dreaded question that all mixed media artists get. You try to explain it and it's still not clear. Basically mixed media at its very heart is just using more than one media when you are creating, but it kind of goes further than that because it's really about allowing yourself to be free with your work in such a way that you don't necessarily approach things with preconceived ideas. And that sounds like, you know, a very art school way to describe it. But basically, to me, it's freedom. You can put anything anywhere, cover anything up, uncover anything, and end up in a place completely different than you may have thought you were going to. And in doing so, you're usually happy. I know sometimes when I sketch, and I'm trying to sketch something, if it doesn't go where I want it to go, I'm usually unhappy. So for me, there's so much freedom in not needing my work to look like anything but what it ends up looking like. It's interesting because I was going to ask you about drawing and um, do you need to be able to draw to do this? And it sounds like you don't. Oh, the answer is definitely no. And in fact, when I teach, I often talk about mark making. I put the term as mark making kind of like doodling because when you say drawing or sketching to somebody who is not that comfortable with it it usually elicits some anxiety where when you say well we're just going to be making marks which in all honesty can be the same thing it opens up a world where people can think yeah i can do that and in fact everybody can now freedom is can also be overwhelming right so you can sit down you can go okay got a blank page, I've got endless art supplies, now what? So how are you as a teacher helping people to kind of what's like, how are you dropping uh, the sand into their oyster so you get a pearl? Like what is the thing that, that kicks it off? Well, that, that's actually really a good point because that's something that most people deal with in definitely at the beginning, but sometimes even years into it. Um, I, I really take two approaches. Uh, the, the main one is that I let people know that rather than thinking of specifics, they can think of generalities. So instead of sitting in front of 400 bottles of paint and trying to figure out which color, I tell them it doesn't matter, just grab anything that looks dark to you. And then your next layer is going to be anything that looks light. And if it looks muted, then it's anything that looks bright. So that the only decision you have to make is something so basic that if you allow yourself to do this, it's actually pretty easy. And I think when people do that more and more, they really come to realize that in mixed media, it almost doesn't matter the individual choice because it's just going to lead you to the next layer, which is then going to lead you to the next layer. The, the other approach I take is just asking people who feel overwhelmed to choose a very limited 
a pallet or a limited supply. So I'll say, you know, go into that box filled of thousands of collage pieces that you've, you know, bought or made and grab six, like close your eyes and grab six. That's what you're going to use. And invariably, um, if they let themselves, they can create something really special so that they can go forward without being overwhelmed when that increases. That's interesting because, I mean, it has a sort of a jazz like quality to it. It's, it's improvisation. It's responding to what came before. And, you know, you may start with a little bit of an idea, but you have to be willing to let go, willing to play and just and enjoy the medium, right? Enjoy all these supplies that you have, the materials, feel them, but also go in without a preconception. I think that's very difficult for people sometimes because you think you have a goal. I think I want to end up with this thing. So I'm just going to have to do the steps to get there. But I mean, I've seen it in your classes. You don't even seem to know what you're going to come out with. It's just sort of like, well, let's see where it goes. And, and... Yeah, I like, I like to teach the way I create. I don't want to teach anything other than my way. And for me, when I sit down to create, you're right, I might have a general idea. Maybe I'm feeling like I really want to use a blue palette, or I have a great collage piece, some rusty piece that I want to use. And that starts it. But really, I, I never know where I want to go. So, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, like, do students realize, yes, I'm prepared, even though I say, I got no clue what we're doing today. I don't know where this is going to end up because that's exactly how I create. Yeah, I think you're, people... you're, you're, you're very experienced. So, so I think it's kind of like having an experienced guide where we may not know where, we, this may be a brand new place that we're going to, but you kind of know how to, you have survival skills that will get us to a destination of some kind. I think that's probably true. Think of it as traveling. There are some people who have an agenda. They, they're going to visit a city they've never been. They look up all the hotels, all the streets. And if somebody that they're with says, oh, oh, that looks cool. Let's go there. You know, one person might be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try and see where it takes us. And another person might be saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, at 1230, we have to be at that museum. So it's also, I think, something that works well for some people and leads some people to struggle a lot just from their personalities and the way they approach, you know, the bigger picture of the world. Right. Let's talk about journaling. In what way is this journaling? Because a lot of what you're making is somewhat abstract. It's not, it doesn't look like today I did this and, you know, I'm looking forward to that. It feels more like feelings or something. What, what, what is the journaling aspect of it? And how does, how does it work for you as, as, as a journal? Well, I think first I'll say that there are so many different mixed media styles. And so mine is definitely abstract. It's just my preference. It's kind of the way I work. But there's lots of people who do mixed media that is representational and they'll either draw or collage use, using objects, which you know might make it feel more like a traditional sketchbook in a manner of speaking. But, but for me, it's journaling is different from creating art in a couple different ways that are pretty powerful, I think. Um, usually when I'm journaling and I'm working in a journal, there's something behind it other than just wanting to make art. Either I'm in a bad mood or maybe I'm in a good mood. I'm reflecting on something. Just like if I had a journal that was primarily words, I'm, I'm taking whatever I'm experiencing, feeling, and I'm putting it into the abstraction. You know, maybe my mark making is really dark and heavy one day, or maybe it's kind of light and airy. It's kind of reflecting what I'm feeling. And then also for me, and I think this is really important, journal, journaling is different in terms of the outcome. When I journal, I am at my freest. It, it, I, I kind of think I understand it, and sometimes I don't, but I know that when I make a piece of art on a wood panel, it always looks different than the art I make in my journal. There's just some sense of, I can let myself go, I can turn the page, I can cover it up, it's less precious, there's 60 more pages, it doesn't matter, no one's going to see it, even if I know I might like be posting it on Instagram, no one's going to see it. There's just an extra level of freedom that, that I think allows people who want to work in mixed media uh, avenue to really, really play and let go. I also love all the forms like, I mean, we've been talking about journals and sketchbook 
pages, but it's also objects, as you mentioned, wood panels, objects, boxes, uh, things in frames. I mean, there's there's kind of no end to it. You could have three dimensional things. You could have um, sculptural elements. Can you just talk a bit about that, about the broad range of ways in which mixed media can manifest? Sure. I think that you can think of mixed media as fully visual in the sense that all you're going to be doing is using uh, art supplies and not even using text or words. And you can have it just be on the page, whatever you're drawing, designing, painting, however it looks. And it could be flat or te a little textural, but basically you're using paints and, and inks and things like that. You can also go the opposite direction and have a mixed media journal that is very text heavy, where you work, say, over a background that you've, that you've painted or, or used ink to create or collage. And then you use the elements that are in the design of the background to determine where your words go, kind of like journaling blocks, they could be called. But you can absolutely go in other directions where you use 3D objects. I love to use found objects in my work. And they do find their way in some of my kind of journal slash artist books where I will, you know, I live in New York. I pick up crap off the street all the time. You know, it's treasure, but it's crap, really. And that will find its way into my art and kind of reflect my, my, my own personal experience. It, it's kind of endless. And because many artists, mixed media artists who journal, will also often make their own book structure, then you can make your book structure with the type of artwork you're gonna make in mind. You know, you might, want, you might have something that's very loosely bound so that you have the space to be able to put 3D objects. Just different, different approaches uh, depending upon where you wanna go. But again, it's sort of like that freedom. It, it, it goes anywhere, just anywhere. Yeah, that's what I love about it too. Is is the surprises and the the. the... I think I'm in some ways a, a fairly restrained person when it comes to a lot of this stuff. I find, I struggle with it. I think I'm one of your strugglers because I'm used to you know drawing and watercoloring and making things that look like things, and I've always struggled a bit with abstraction. I almost can't let myself play, but then sometimes I do, and sometimes I'll get into it, and and then I'll realize a lot of it is about the process the fun of the process, right? As opposed to just constantly wondering about the composition and this, where we're going to end up. It's more just like this feeling of playing and being here now is so great. And I think mixed media is just such a powerful tool for that kind of almost meditative flow kind of experience. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. You get in the zone and you, you kind of just go with it. And in fact, I mean, really it's all about the process. The way I work is just very layered. And so I work and I work over and I work over again, and then I cut back in and I work over again. And it's that process and sort of all of a sudden, you kind of look and you're like, oh, I'm done. Like you don't even know like, okay, I'm going to add one more layer and I'm done. It just happens. I, I kind of always say to people, you're, you're always only one layer away from magic because most mixed media artists have been there where they're looking at what they're making and it is a hot mess and not the good kind. And you can easily get frustrated. You can get out of the zone. You can, you know, the critic comes out. And once you get in that place, it's really hard to play and move forward creatively. So it's about recognizing that that's just part of the process. When you're working in mixed media, it doesn't have to look good until the end. And really, it doesn't even have to look good then, but most people would like it to look good. But while you're working along the way, if it looks like not good, that, that's okay. And one, all of a sudden, that one layer gives you the magic. It's really amazing. And it's so much fun as a teacher to see people experience that live or, you know, on video where they just do one more thing and you can kind of see their face. You know what's happening. Right. Stop, stop, take it away. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your class. So you've been teaching at, at Spark. We've been doing stuff at Sketchbook School for years. You were part mm -hmm. of a really phenomenal class that we did called Mixed Media Journaling. Um, but you've taught workshops for us in Spark, but now you're teaching a regular 
class. Tell me a bit about about how you approach that class and like what what the experience has been like for you teaching in Spark at Sketchbook School. Okay, well, the class is called the Aptured Page, which I guess is a takeoff on the Altered Page. Um, somebody um, in this chat, not me, gave gave the class that name, and um, it is apt, so to speak. And it's every two weeks, and it has really been a pleasure for me to do this for a lot of reasons. But the class itself, it's working in a journal and with the idea that mixed media doesn't have restrictions, everybody can have whatever journal they want, any size, it could be handmade, it could be store-bought, it could be ring-bound, it doesn't matter. And everybody gets a short list of supplies to work with for each class. And there's always a note on the supply list that says, but remember, mixed media is all about freedom. So if you don't have it or don't want to use it, go rogue and do whatever you want. And lots of people, I will say, do that, which is thrill actually thrilling for me when I see that happen. I, I like that. And we've just been working through a journal and we have been identifying, I guess, different aspects of mixed media to focus on. So one, one week might be um, subtractive techniques in mixed media. Another week has been, actually a series has been using watercolor in mixed media because it's probably a much less used in mixed media than say acrylic paint and inks. So I really wanted to bring that in. Talk about um, uh, sort of letting the layers speak to you, which, you know, mixed media artist totally understands people in my world who don't know anything about art think that's a little bit you know, off the charts, this idea that the layers are going to talk to you, but but they do, and um, you just need to listen and to be able to recognize. And it's really been fun. We've torn pages so that we're working on torn pages in the book. We've, um, well, I suggest people randomly choose a page. I don't like to work in my book from front to back. I'd rather just open it up and sort of randomly go to try to help people learn to lit to kind of let loose and just be a little bit less uh, traditional perhaps. And um, yeah, it's it's just been fun. And it's been great to see the response and the reaction. And one of the things I love is in the schoolyard, which is part of the community, people will post images of their work after and lots of people leave comments. And it's really interesting because the work is a little different than a lot of the traditional sketchbooks class classes. I know you have lots of things there, but there are some people who sketch within my class, but most aren't. And so it's really interesting to see also the reaction of the community who are not in the class to the work that's different than some of the other classes. Yeah, no, people are always excited by it and inspired by it to try their own stuff, even if they weren't in the class. What is So what is your uh, experience of the students? Because you get to engage with them. You're not just lecturing and demoing, but you're actually engaging and uh, answering questions or giving some kind of response to things. I know that you do that in the schoolyard as well. You make comments. Tell me a bit about your, your experience with working with Sketchbook School's Spark members. Well, first of all, I find that um, people are really passionate. The people who are coming to the live class, they're there. I, um, I'm getting to know most of them because most of the people who come, come every two weeks. So it's a pretty consistent class. And for me, it's been really good because I've actually begun to recognize some of the different uh, participants' styles and can reflect back on, oh, remember when you did that two weeks ago? That has a kind of suggestion that your voice is this or that, which I think is really good, helpful feedback. And also, we always do, I wouldn't even call it a crit because it's really what it's about is it's about um, finding the good in everybody's work, but being able to identify it so they kind of see perhaps a direction that they can go in so we take a good 10 or 15 minutes at the end of every class for anybody who wants to they don't have to they will share their work and a little bit of their reaction to the class and i'll give some feedback and that's really really been fun uh, being able to spend time with people at the end of the class and getting to know their styles i've just found it to be just really fun and and very fulfilling both for me and i think the students as well right um well i know the people love it and they look forward to it a lot. And it's just, I just love having you be part of our 
community. I've known you for a really long time. And, you know, we're both people who started making art later in life. We're not necessarily mm-hmm. professionally trained people, but art has meant a lot to both of us. And I think that that's part of both of our missions is to kind of infect people with a love of and, and a love of making art and also a confidence in doing it mm-hmm. so that they can they can do anything. And I think that you really help people to get to places that they never thought that they could get. So that's it's really good. And that's that's so much part of Spark is just try stuff out, try something you've never done before and let's see where it goes. And then it just is liberating and and a lot of fun. So thank thanks so much for being part of that. No, I really appreciate that. And it's it's definitely true. And to see people make something that they're not happy with and then see them understand that that's fine and okay and you don't have to spend time even making it better because it is the process and it's just part of what happens. Yeah, it's really freeing and, and I love being able to help people get to that place. The, the couple things I always say to people is, um, A, don't get attached because if you really, really love something, I'm gonna ask you to cover it up because that's part of mixed media. And also don't be upset if you don't like something because I'm gonna ask you to cover it up and you're gonna turn it into something else one second later. And that's just so hard for people. You know, you see sometimes students will do literally two layers of paint and they'll look down and you can tell they love it. And then I'm saying, okay, now we're gonna all, you know, splash some ink over it. And you see the hesitation, but it's just supporting them moving. Um, which is exactly what you do. It's kind of moving through the demons and those voices in your head. And it's just interesting because I think I realized this when I started teaching back in the day that yes, I'm teaching art, but art is sort of the conduit to teaching all these other things, the sort of way of looking at your work, looking at yourself, feeling confident, feeling okay with being uncomfortable with what you've done, going to places you might not have gone before, taking risks, That's kind of what it's all about. And I definitely think that that sort of matches with with the with uh, the school itself. Yeah, we're all on a journey. And, uh, you know, that you have to keep moving, you have to keep trying stuff and enjoying the the, the process, and not just obsessing about the results. So thank you so much for being part of of Spark and, uh, and for chatting with me today. Absolutely, Danny, anytime. I hope you can tell what a great teacher Seth is just from that conversation. He has brought so many people into a whole new way of making art. And he also makes it accessible no matter what level you're entering into it. He shows you how to turn art making into play, but also serious, expressive, powerful work that is extremely inspiring both to look at and to make. Seth teaches with us on a regular basis. He's been a part of Sketchbook School for a long time. And I'd love you to join his class and all the many other classes that we teach in drawing and watercoloring and lettering and writing and portraiture and urban sketching and all these other things that are part of the Spark membership program. Hundreds and hundreds of people are gathering for two to three hours a day making art and you can work at your own schedule at your own um, speed and take all kinds of interesting classes and really liberate yourself creatively. It doesn't matter what your past history is. It doesn't matter what your level of experience is. You can jump into Spark and get fired up as so many people have and they're making more art than they ever have in their life thanks to our great instructors like Seth. If you'd like to learn more about uh, Spark, Spark at Sketchbook School and possibly try out a two-week free trial period, just go to sketchbookschool.com slash spark and sign up today. Seth and I are both looking forward to seeing you joining our community and being part of making art together. I'll see you soon, I hope. Bye-bye.